Okay. Um, so we begin now. And uh, the first thing I want to do is, is just to welcome all of you and say how happy I am to see so many old friends and to have us back together in this virtual way. And to thank you for, for coming to listen to David and me talk about um, Sir Walter Scott and, and, and Waverly. Um, I, I just want to make sure that everyone knows David. So David, would you uh, wave to people and say, say hello? Uh, David Brownell hello. is a, a longtime um, a participant in the Dickens universe. And uh, he has very kindly agreed to help me to talk about Sir Walter Scott because he, he knows a great many things that I don't know and can catch me when I make a mistake. Um, but we thought we would- Vice versa, I hope. <laughs> we would make a, a, a good team. Correct me as needed. Okay, and, and you do the same for me. Um, I, I thought something that would be fun to do just at, as a first exercise is to ask people to introduce themselves. Just to say, say your name and say where you're calling from. Ernie has already said that he's calling from Idaho, but I think we have people from many different parts of, of the country. I, I don't know how far afield we are, but anyway, I, I'm, I don't know how to control the order in which people speak. Uh, but is, is there, if we go from top to bottom, is that a, a, a way to proceed? Uh, um, anyway, I, I'm John Jordan, and I'm actually physically in San Francisco. Ah. So um, introduce yourselves, please. I'm Bruce Cotter. I am physically in Felton, as you can see from the red ones behind me. Aha. Okay. I'm Peggy Waters. I'm in Dunn Lomond. I have the redwoods facing me. Okay. I'm Tiger. I'm in Santa Cruz. In Santa Cruz. I'm Karen. Randy. I'm Randy Perizzini, and I'm in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh -huh. Welcome, Randy. And he's my friend, so I'll go next. I'm Karen Kleinman in Santa Fe, New Mexico. <laughs> Karen, thank you. I'm Moira Waddell, and I'm in Los Angeles. I'll, I'll piggyback on that. Um, I'm Kate Lonsdale, and I'm here with my friend Deborah Gormley, and um, we're, um, I'm from Pasadena, so I'm nearby. Woo! Hello, Los Angeles. <laughs> Southern California. This is my hometown, born and raised in LA. I'm Wendy Martin. I'm here in Santa Cruz. I'm in Southern California too, Glenn and Matthews. I'm in Laguna Beach. And I just have to tell you, John and others, that I recognized Elisa down here, uh, who was a housemate of my daughter's at Yale, and I haven't seen her in years. So this is a red letter day. <laughs> so there are many reunions. Hi, I'm Brad Weiger, and I'm in uh, Little Tokyo, in downtown Los Angeles. Hello. <laughs> Glad to have you. I'm, I'm Elisa. Oh, sorry. I'm Elisa Klaus, and I'm in Santa Cruz, and thrilled to see um, see Glenna. I'm Kid Andrews, and I'm in Corvallis, Oregon. Glad to have I'm an Oregon represented. <laughs> Uh, I'm Ann Stapleton. I'm in um, Iowa City, Iowa. Oh, wow. Okay. Thank you, Win, for farthest away. <laughs> I'm Deborah I'm, Cantrell. I'm in Scottsdale, Arizona. Okay. I'm Jody Howe, and I'm in Sunnyvale, California. I'm uh, Robert Sarabian from Wapaka, Wisconsin. Oh, my oh. goodness. Wow. Hey. <laughs> I was born in Madison. Hello, fellow cheesehead. Yeah, hello, hello. I'm Cindy Palacritti and I'm in Santa Cruz. Carl Wilson, Portland, Oregon. Another person from Oregon. 
Linda Dinamore, Claremont, Southern California. Okay. Glad to have you. I'm Ann Dayton from Houston, Texas. Welcome. Hi, I'm Faiza, and this is my eight-month-old Gibran, and we're in Palo Alto. Oh. <laughs> Beautiful. I'm Belinda Egan, and I'm in Santa Cruz, Live Oak. I'm Tara Thomas, and I'm also in Santa Cruz. Hi, everyone. Woo <laughs> Else? I'm Bruce Thompson, also in Santa Cruz. Hello, Bruce. I'm Murray Baumgarten. I'm in Santa Cruz, just up from the junior high school. Okay. I'm Mark well, Halperin. I'm in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, you win the long distance. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> hey. Not quite yet. <laughs> I'm Dan Stewart. I'm from Lubbock, Texas. Okay. Any other who have not introduced themselves and located themselves for us? John, did you see a late arrival? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. And where this are you? Yes, who are you and um, where I'm in are you? San Francisco. I'm Sarah Wilcox. Hi. Hello, Sarah. You have a late arrival with glasses on. He has to unmute himself. Hi there. Hey, John. This Hi. is Adam Abraham. I'm checking in today from Houston, Texas. Hello, Thanks, Adam. Adam. Hi guys. Thanks Lovely for organizing. To see you. Lovely to, to see, see you. you. <laughs> Tim uh, invited me so he gets the credit. Yeah, yeah. Is there anyone else who has not yet identified themselves and given a location? So I, I expect that there will be people joining us as we proceed. And um, I expect that not everyone will be able to stay the entire time. So that's perfectly okay. It's one of the things that um, this technology makes possible. So uh, let me, let me uh, say a, a couple of other things. I have some announcements that I want to make. I mean, the, uh, this is the Pickwick Book Club. Uh, sponsored by the Dickens Project, and it began as a book club for people who were able to attend in person in Santa Cruz. And there were a few people who, who phoned in or came in remotely, but it was really for people in Santa Cruz. But now, because of the pandemic, we have gone virtual, and with this technology, we have, an op we have opened up the Pickwick Club from Santa Cruz to the world. So um, as you have heard, we are representatives of um, many different parts of the United States. So welcome to all of you. Uh, one other thing I wanted to announce is that most of you, perhaps all of you, have received notifications from Courtney about the Dickens to Go program that we are sponsoring that the Dickens Project has put on. In this year, when we don't have a Dickens universe to bring us all together, we came up with the idea of a way to give a little bit of Dickens to anyone who was interested. And so this series called Dickens To Go is a series of short videos in which Dickens Project faculty and students and Dickens Universe participants give a short presentation about a favorite passage of theirs from Dickens and say a few words about why they selected it. And uh, our intention is to uh, uh, promote these and uh, to present them on a weekly basis on Monday mornings. Courtney is in charge of this. And 
We have started it. We're now in the second week, and tomorrow will be our third Dickens to Go program. And we hope to continue these for the entire year. So I hope that everyone here will uh, consider, consider doing a video of a favorite passage from Dickens. And we have some simple guidelines about how to do it. And Courtney can help you if you're interested in doing one and are not quite sure how to make a video. Um, I, I made the first one, Renee, Fox, the co-director of the Dickens Project, made the second one. Uh, Joanna Rotke is the third one who will appear tomorrow. And then I won't say anything further about who else is in the lineup. Uh, although Murray Baumgarten, my uh, dear friend from Santa Cruz, is among them. And other people who uh, are uh, here present, I hope, will, will appear. So Dickens to go. And then the third thing I wanted to announce is that we plan to have, it won't be a Dickens universe, but we plan to have a series of special videos during what would have been the Dickens universe week. That is to say, uh, July 27th to 31st, we will have a series of special panels in which the organizers of the Dickens universe that had to be postponed, will talk about why they selected the two books that they chose, uh, David Copperfield and Iola Leroy. And they will be joined by other colleagues, people who would have been among the speakers this summer, and who I hope will be among the speakers next summer Excellent. when we meet again in Santa Cruz. So uh, those videos will be uh, screened the week of uh, the Dickens universe that isn't um, the 27th to the 31st of, of, uh, of next month, July. So uh, that's my, uh, those are my announcements. And then just procedurally, the way that David and I have agreed that we will handle our discussion. There are so many people, it's going to be uh, a challenge, I think, to have a genuine discussion, but I hope we can. Um, I've divided the, uh, the first 23 chapters of Waverly into five sections. And I will lead a discussion on the first section, and then we'll have some room for some questions and discussion. Then David will lead the second section, and then we'll pause again and have time for questions and discussion, and so on through the first 23 chapters of Waverly. I should say that I hope you all uh, are aware that uh, chapter 23 is the last chapter of volume one. Waverly was published originally in three volumes, and so we have three meetings scheduled for uh, discussion of Waverly, and we have divided the, the readings according to the different volumes. So as you read, you should pay attention to the volume as a, as a structural unit. Why does uh, Scott end the first volume with chapter 23? The, the the, the final chapter, the first chapter, and the final chapter of a volume are particularly important. So you should, should pay attention to that. So there are some big questions that David and I want to pose. And uh, we may not have time to answer them all in sufficient depth. But I hope by the end of our third meeting that we will have addressed them directly or indirectly. And the, the first question, first big question, uh, is, is my question. And it's a question that actually uh, I can make a reference to something that our colleague Ian Duncan says in his introduction to the Penguin edition of Waverly. And he says, this is the first sentence of his introduction, Waverly has a strong claim to be the most influential work in the modern history of the novel. So, wow, that's a, that's a big 
claim that this novel is the most influential novel in the history of the modern novel. So I want to ask why was it so influential and in what ways was it influential? And in particular, since this is a Dickens Universe uh, book club, uh, how was it influential for Dickens? But I don't want to talk about that until the last meeting of the, of the group, the connection to Dickens. So I just put that question on, on the table. Um, so the other questions that are the big questions that I, I want us to think about are, where did Sir Walter Scott come from before he wrote Waverly? And David can help us to answer that question. And a third question is, what is new? What is different about Waverly from the novels that preceded it? So David, I'm going to turn things over to you and ask you, if you would, to um, tell us about Scott before Waverly. OK. Uh, David, uh, may I interrupt for just a moment? Sure. Uh, so we'd like to ask folks to raise their hand if they have questions. And um, I'll unmute you uh, when you have uh, the floor. Uh, so to raise your hand, what you'll want to do is click on the participants button. Um, and you'll see a sidebar that comes up and you can see everyone's name. Um, and then there's a, um, a button uh, below people's names that says raise hand. Um, and it will cause a blue hand to appear next to your name. Um, so please take advantage of that. Thank you, Courtney. Okay. Uh, Walter Scott. I want to take him as far as 1814, the year Waverley was published. He's not yet Sir Walter Scott. He was born in 1771, 15th of August. So next year will be his 250th birthday. I trust you to celebrate accordingly. Uh, his birth date puts him in the first generation of English Romantic poets, roughly contemporary with Wordsworth and Coleridge. They were people, Wordsworth and Coleridge at least, were enthusiastic about the French Revolution. And then they soured on it and became conservative as Scott was. Uh, generally, He's the most likable author that I know of. Everyone who knew him liked him. Uh, he had very good literary taste. He appreciated his contemporaries and became friendly with many of them, even ones who weren't at all like him. For example, he appreciated Jane Austen very much. He wrote a review of Emma which was laudatory. And in his letters, he talks about rereading her books. He says, I can do the big bow wow stuff as well as anyone now living. But then he expresses marvel at what Austin does. So so many authors are jealous of other authors. He was friendly with people like Wordsworth, Byron, Sothi, Maria Edgeworth, Susan Ferrier, James Hogg. So it's, when Waverly was published, he was in his early 40s and he was already famous. Uh, he was the ninth child of his parents. Uh, only three others were still alive. Edinburgh was not a healthy city. His father was a successful writer of the Signet, which was the Scottish equivalent of a solicitor. The Scottish legal system was not exactly like the English and the Scots had no desire to be part of the English system. Uh, among, there were a lot of peculiarities, one of them being that a Scots jury 
could bring in three verdicts in a trial, guilty, innocent, and not proven, which left you with something of a cloud over your reputation. Uh, when he was about 18 months, Scott developed polio. His right leg shriveled and he was sent to his grandfather's farm down closer to the English border. The family worked to get him to be able to crawl again. It was described as a sweet tempered child eager to learn. Since he wasn't able to run about with other children, he listened to the family and the farm workers telling stories. And he learned about the border, Thomas the Rhymer, Michael Scott the Wizard, the border warriors. Scott's great grandfather, he learned, had refused to cut his beard until James II or his heirs were back on the throne. He lost his fortune after being out with the Jacobites in 1715. He was known as Beardy. Uh, eventually he was able to stand and he could even run with the aid of a staff. For a number of years, he was back and forth between Edinburgh and, and the farm. He learned to read, read Shakespeare early. He read very widely, developing a familiarity with the English writers before his own time, who is able, whom he's able to quote quite freely. When he was 12, he discovered Bishop Percy's Reliques of Ancient English Poetry, an unscholarly collection of ballads from the mid 1700s. Uh, the ballads were improved by the bishop. This is part of the beginnings of the Romantic Revolution, Romanticism coming in, an interest in the past, an interest in ballads rather than dismissing them as primitive. Scott bought his own copy and read it again and again. He said later, love of natural beauty more especially when combined with ancient ruins or remains of our father's piety or splendor, became with me an insatiable passion. Came an apprentice, other, but continued wide reading, learning Italian and French, teaching himself Spanish, and eventually studying German so he could read the new German romantic writers. When he was 19, he fell passionately in love with a 15 year old girl who was not old enough to marry, nor did he have the income, but he intended to marry her when she grew up. He was out collecting ballads during this period, seven trips in seven years with a friend who said he was never out of good humor. He began translating German, starting with Berger's Lenore, a ballad. And these were his publications, rough and ready translations. His alas grew up and fell in love with one of his friends. Scott tried to hide his disappointment. He later wrote, what we love in those early days is generally rather a fanciful creation of our own than a reality. We built statues of snow and weep when they melt. He joined a volunteer light dragoon unit ready to fight a French invasion. His lameness didn't bother him on horseback. During a summer tour of the lakes in England, he met and fell in love with Charlotte Ch Charpente from a French family and married her. He became sheriff deputy of Selkirkshire with an income of 300 pounds a year. By this point, he was making about a thousand a year. Around 1800, he began putting together his first 
book of his own, Minstrelsy of the Scottish Border, two volumes published in 1802. 800 copies were printed. In this period, print runs were often very small. And that remained somewhat true through the Victorian period. Books were for the carriage trade. By no means everybody bought them. They were expensive. This changed throughout the century, partly with changes in technology. It became possible to turn things to print much more in the same length of time, which cheapened the cost per copy and made it possible for things, for publishers to do things like the multiple thousand copies of Dickens. Uh, there was a new edition of the Minstrelsy in London, a thousand copies and 1500 copies of volume three, which included some ballads by Scott. He's not terribly scholarly either. He included things if he felt that something was missing and he finished some that seemed to him unfinished. In January 1805, he published the first of his own long narrative poems, The Lay of the Last Minstrel, which made him famous. Initial press run 750 copies, which sold at a guinea each. You price things in guineas, not pounds, if you were working for the carriage trade. Uh, in five years, there were a uh, a total of about 15,000 copies sold, which went up to 27,000 by the end of the decade. So he was a real best-selling poet. He was known. He set up his usual routine for writing, got up at 5 a.m., went to the stables to feed his horse, at his desk by six with his dogs beside him, breakfast at nine, then two more hours of work, including answering letters, then out for a ride. Uh, when he wrote a poem about Flodden Field, which was a great Scotch, Scottish disaster, a co constable, an Edinburgh publisher, offered him a thousand guineas for, for it. That was a bunch of money in those days. It sold for a guinea and a half, 28,000 copies in four years. He went into partnership with a school friend of his, James Ballantyne, and engaged to try and keep Ballantyne's press busy. So he took on editing a complete edition of Dryden, which ran to 18 volumes. Then he followed that with a complete edition of Swift, 19 volumes. He used needy writers as his helpers on these. Uh, the Lady of the Lake comes along next, 25,000 copies sold in eight months at two guineas. Scott's poetry invented the Scottish tourist industry. People went to Scotland to see the places that Scott had described. What someone on the Tweed was a farmhouse. He christened it Abbotsford and embarked on a career of building. It still lived. It be quite something by the time he was done with it. In 1870, he was offered the Poet Laureateship, which was a dubious distinction at that point, since the people who'd held it recently were mostly hacks. Scott said he thought it should go to a needy writer, and he turned it down, but pushed Robert Southey for it, who was indeed a needy writer, and went to Southey, who rehabilitated it a good deal.
he was followed by Wordsworth, who was followed by Tennyson. So things were on the up and up for the poet laureate ship. So Waverly, he said he started the book earlier and set it aside. Uh, he published it anonymously. There were 5,000 copies sold by the end of the year. If you want a biography of Scott, there's a good one by Edgar Johnson, whom you may recall because his two volume biography of Dickens way back was one of the th things that contributed to the revival of scholarly interest in Dickens. Uh, various reasons why he chose to be anonymous. I think there was a real mixture. Part of it was that novels were just not respectable. You may remember in Northanger Abbey, at some point someone asks the heroine what she's reading. And she says, only a novel. And the author's voice breaks in, only a novel. I can't quote the whole thing, but Austin says it involves the best thought and the best words. It should not be scorned in any way. But she also helped improve the reputation. Uh, he thought writing a novel wasn't perhaps decorous for a clerk of sessions, which was the one of the jobs he held an important job in the legal profession. He probably also, if it was a flop, didn't want to cheapen his value as a poet. And I think he enjoyed the mystification of it and kept it up for a long time for that reason. It also meant he didn't have to answer questions like, why didn't you let so-and-so happen? Or I think you should have done he could uh, he could deny it, and he did. He kept on writing poetry, and went on to a new novel at this point. And I'll stop there. We've got into eighteen fourteen. So um, I I thought that I I would uh, make an opportunity now for people to ask questions, but I'm also interested in. Uh, knowing just in a very general way what your experience of reading Sir Walter Scott is, of reading Waverley. I mean, what did you like? What did you enjoy? What did you find difficult? Is it a fast read, an easy read? Is it a slow and difficult, perhaps painful read? I'm, I'm just curious to know how, how people experience their encounter with Scott. Some of you may have read Scott before. Some of you may be reading Scott for the very first time. So um, let me just ask you to raise hands and Courtney help us to um, recognize people. Uh, Brad, would you? Hi, you mentioned it's great information. Thank you so much. Very exciting. Um, you mentioned that he had an insatiable passion in ballads or in, in stories or romanticism or developed one. And I was curious if you could attribute that insatiable passion at such a young age to anything in particular or any circumstance in his life that might lead him to nurture this, this connection to narrative. Well, the first thing that he got in the way of stories was about the border, uh, lots of which involve cattle raids, banditry, battles. Uh, there are ballads, the ones later collected as the child ballads by Professor Child the Park. Uh, Romanticism was creeping in all over Europe in various ways. And part of it was this fascination 
with the past, including what had previously been thought of as primitive times. So the Middle Ages came back in. During the period before Waverly, there'd been about 40 years of, in which the English novel didn't have any distinguished practitioners. All sorts of people were doing all sorts of experimental books, many of which you read as a graduate student, but don't feel an urge to return to. Uh, uh, some of them had medieval settings. Uh, uh, some of them went supernatural. Uh, it was Anne Radcliffe's novels in which people were always going into dark corners in castles in Italy that they shouldn't have poked into. Uh, back to your question, I think because he heard these ballads and was thrilled by them as a child, that that was, he somehow kept that fascination and didn't dismiss it. If I could just jump in briefly to say one more thing in addition to what David said, I, I think that the, the, the love of ballads is consistent with uh, the interest in folklore and, and folk culture that is growing in interest during this time. And ballads are, are basically a popular form of, of, of poetry. And the connection to narrative is, uh, is important for all of Scott because uh, his poems are not lyrical poems for the most part, like the poems of Wordsworth. They're narrative poems, they're long narratives. And so Scott is interested in storytelling. He's, he's basically a, a, a narrative poet um, rather than a lyric poet. So, I'll say one more thing. The poems are very readable. Scott always has a, a good pace and they move forward rapidly and can still be enjoyed. My mother could quote long passages of Scott's poetry uh, and they were narratives. So that, that dates me as well as my mother. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions and general reactions to reading Scott. What's what do you like? What do you find difficult? Lana? Yeah, I'm um, I haven't read Scott in years. I read uh, in pursuant to what David just said about the narrative punch. I got in trouble as a freshman in high school when we were reading Lady of the Lake because I I went too fast. I got so caught up with the narrative. And then I didn't, I read that and Ivanhoe. And then I think in my 20s, I read um, Red Gauntlet and The Heart of Midlothian, but I haven't read Scott since then. And I started off reading this. It's slow, but boy, by the time you get to the Highlands, I mean, I was so caught up in the atmosphere. <laughs> and I have read a certain amount of um, the contemporaries. I've read Fanny Burney, I've read Anne Radcliffe, uh, certainly Jane Austen. And I can't think of another writer from this era where I've just, I, I, should, I have to tell you one other thing. Before the pandemic, I had booked a trip to the Scottish Highlands this September. And boy, when I was reading Waverly, I was like, no, no, I'm so disappointed I can't go. Anyhow, that's what struck me this time was how, even though I'm a much more sophisticated reader than when I was a freshman in high school, I got swept up in the atmospherics. Thank you. Um, D David's comment that S Scott invented Scottish tourism uh, still lived. Uh, people, you know, it's a tourist destination from all around the world. Um, other questions, other reactions? Uh, Bruce Cotter. I, um, I've, yeah, I've read a fair amount of Scott in my time. I quite liked 
um, Kenilworth and uh, Talisman, I think they're my two favorites, but I've also read Ivanhoe and Rob Roy and a few others. Um, I must say that I find Waverly um, slow to get into. My goodness, does he like to do exposition through the first, I'm literally, I'm only at about, um, I think the 17th chapter at this point. Um, but my word, I just keep waiting, you know, when uh, when there there was finally the abortive drunken sword fight at the uh, at the ladies uh, inn, I was like, oh good, something's happened. <laughs> so that's that was my reaction. <laughs> okay, so we've had a couple of comments that talk about Waverly and, and perhaps Scott more generally as being a slow read and difficult to get into. So I'm I'm curious to know if that's a general experience. Uh, Deborah? Uh, actually, this is Kate, where uh, I'm actually in the same place, but um, uh, I was struck by a couple of things. Um, at first, Bruce, you're talking about exposition, and the, the way I had put it is I said, this guy never met a digression he didn't like. And it, to me, it reminded me a lot of um, uh, you know, not quite the same degree of something like Tristram Shandy or so sort of these 18th century novels where they go off on these kind of tangents where, you know, you have to, you don't just meet a character, you have to learn their entire history and everything about them in order to just even have a conversation with them. You know, the narrator has to tell you everything. Um, but back to my personal experience, um, I was first exposed to Walter Scott with The Heart of Midlothian in John Jordan's class a million years ago. I think back, I think we read it in the original, like the galley proofs, I think it was so long ago. Um, but um, I have, you know, I had been assigned him in, in graduate school and I guess I had always had this prejudice where it seemed like Walter Scott was sort of like this artifact, this old fashioned kind of writer that we don't really read anymore. Whereas the other writers, who are writing novels at the same time. I think of Jane Austen, I think of Mary Shelley, and I think of, you know, seemed so much more contemporary or, or to meet my contemporary sensibilities. Um, and I think of, you know, like sentences from Austen that still sparkle today. And I would think of sentences from Sir Walter Scott that you could never write today. You could never write a novel like this today. Um, but I have to admit, once I started reading Waverly for this, I was struck by how much I loved the narrative voice. I loved this guy, I loved this, this narrator and how funny he is. Like I had forgotten or never realized or never appreciated how funny he can be and how wry and, uh, <sighs> is satirical almost in a way and that's no, these are not adjectives that I had associated in my mind with Sir Walter Scott. Um, <laughs> languorous, uh, expository, um, slow, those are words I had associated with Sir Walter Scott. Um, the other thing I sort of that was coming up I thought was really interesting is the number of characters, somebody mentioned Northanger Abbey and um, I, you know, I, I taught Frankenstein a few times. The number of characters who are self-educated and who find their way in life by reading the wrong quote unquote books. Um, and this is, you know, this is, Frankenstein is a, a novel framed by a narrator who reads the wrong books and decides he's gonna <laughs> discover the North Pole. And of course, Victor reads the wrong books and decides he's gonna, you know, conquer death. Um, you know, in Northanger Abbey, she reads the wrong books and, and has goes all on this romantic plot. And this is sort of, it's almost like um, Waverly, you know, Edward, he reads the wrong stuff. He gets exposed to the wrong things at a young age and it just taints him for life. He can't, you know, help but go off on this romantic quest. Those are all excellent observations. Um, particularly, I like the, the observation about reading the wrong books. And of course that has a long, history in the history of the novel, going back to Don Quixote. Um, people who read the wrong books and therefore get a mistaken understanding of the world and have to be educated into a proper understanding. <laughs> yeah. uh, 
and that uh, that's uh, you know sometimes they don't get a complete understanding of the world they live in. But two other things I I would comment on. One is the uh, connection to 18th century literature. You have to remember that that Scott is in his 40s before he starts writing novels. Yeah. And that he's you know he's born in what is it 1775. Uh, David. 71. Yeah, 71. He's really a man of the 18th century. And there are a lot of ways in which his style, that that um, somewhat discursive style, meandering, digressive, uh, is the style of the 18th century essay. And mm -hmm. even of the 18th century novelists like Fielding. And so I, th I think that, that Fielding, and you mentioned um, the his narrator and mm -hmm. uh, I, I think as we as we read more as we read further into Waverly we're going to need to talk about that narrator um, and uh, so why don't we take one more question Ms. Courtney Courtney, do you do you have another questioner? Oh, oh, yes, uh, William. I had always thought that Scott was a was a boys' adventure writer, so I thought I'd sort of missed the opportunity to read Scott because I'd missed him as a boy. So I was delightfully surprised to find a writer who rem who reminded me so much of Fielding, with yes, those satirical digs at human foibles particularly in Sir Everard, but also, of course, in Waverley himself for being so um, influenced by romantic imagination. And also the comical names of uh, Sir Everard's lawyer being Mr. Clip Purse and the clergyman being Mr. Rubric. So that also is very much like Fielding. The part that didn't work for me, which was something that Fielding does and Scott does, but not as well, is that very tedious opening chapter about what it is to be a novelist. And oh, I could have written this kind of book and then I would have said this, and then I could have written this other kind of book and I would have done that. And he goes through about six different genres telling you what he could have written and chose not to. That wore a little thin, um, but I do like it. Once I got past that, I did appreciate the narrator's voice coming in every so often with a wry comment on on again, human foibles, um, and just to give that that narrator's perspective, and also the trials that it is being a narrator. Boy, this is a hard book to write. He tells us at some point. <laughs> this is this is. Thank you for those comments, which are are perceptive and provide a perfect segue for me because the first section of Waverly that I wanted to talk about is chapter one, the introduction. And uh, you said, William, that it didn't work for you, but I wanted to say a, a few things about what I think chapter one is doing and then see if other people have any uh, reactions to it. So chapter one uh, is, it, it's, its title is introduction and it's an introduction to the first major character of the novel, who is the narrator. Um, I think that's what we, that, that's the principal function of the introduction. And yes, it is a, a kind of clearing of the ground. It's a, it's a, 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 a brief and somewhat tongue in cheek dismissal of the fashionable genres of fiction writing of the period. And David has already said that, that the novel was in low repute. The novel was, was not a, uh, it was it was a, a popular form, but it was not what uh, serious writers did, and it's only with really with Jane Austen. And, I mean, it's really it begins with Fielding, who took his art seriously, uh, but uh, uh, for Scott, part of the anonymity of the Waverly novels is that he didn't want to sully his reputation as a as a narrative poet because poetry was a serious 
form of literature by uh, getting associated with the low form of, of the novel. But when he does decide to write novels, uh, he's doing two things. Um, one is he's saying, I'm not going to write a novel in the way that anybody else is currently writing novels. So that first chapter has the function of dismissing Gothic novels and sentimental novels and German style Gothic novels and fashionable novels of contemporary life. He's saying, I'm doing something different. I'm doing something new. And uh, he makes that claim in a kind of offhanded way. It's, it's, not a, 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 it's not as if he's bragging exactly. Uh, he, he's doing it in a, in a kind of facetious or tongue in cheek way. But I think there is something serious to this as a statement of, of ambition. And the thing that he's doing, one of the things that he's doing new that, that novels had not done previously is he's marrying the, uh, the form of, um, of fiction, of, of storytelling with its roots in popular tradition and in popular fiction uh, to history. And history was another genre. Notice that he does not dismiss history writing as a, as a form of literary production. So one of the things that is new about Scott, he's all, it's you know, almost a cliche when you talk about Scott, is to say that Scott invented the historical novel. And when, uh, when Ian Duncan says in the introduction in that sentence that I quoted that Waverley has a good claim to being the most influential novel in the history of the modern novel, it's because of that marriage of storytelling uh, individual fiction, uh, stories of the lives of individuals with the big sweep of, of history. And we can, we can talk more about what history means for Scott. Um, but the main thing I, I wanted to, uh, to say is that the introduction, that first chapter, is really an introduction to a narrator, to a narrator who's going to be our companion, who's going to be our, our guide through the rest of the world that we are experiencing. And um, I think that even though it may strike some people as um, unnecessarily tedious and, and um, that it has an important function in, um, in introducing the novel as a whole. So um, the other thing to say about the introduction is that he gives an explanation of the subtitle of the novel as well as the title. So he claims that he has chosen the name Waverly as the name of his title character in the title of, uh, of the novel. And he says that he, he didn't choose Mortimer or Mordaunt. Uh, or these other heroic names. And he didn't choose Belleville or Belmere, the sort of soft French uh, sounding uh, names. He's picked a name, Waverly, that no one else has, has used. And he uses a metaphor from heraldry. And he says that Waverly is a hero with a white shield. And a white shield means that he doesn't have a heraldic ancestry on his shield. He's, he's if, if you will, he's a kind of blank screen or a blank hero whose exploits remain to be inscribed on his heraldic uh, shield. Um, and we might, you already mentioned the uh, type names that he uses, like uh, rubric for the, for the parson and uh, Sir Everard's friend, um, who's the, the farmer who raises pigs, is called Kill and Cure It. Um, and, you know, there are lots of joke names that one finds in, um, uh, uh, in, in Scott. And that's something that will come down through Dickens as well. But the, the subtitle of Waverley is something he also devotes time to. And he says, 
to 60 years since. And uh, why does he choose 60 years since? And I think that, that subtitle is also very important in terms of Scott's attitude toward history. And if we stop and think about what 60 years ago was, you know, where does, where does that place us? And why 60 years rather than 80 years or then 20 years or 30 years? What, what is there about 60 years? And for us, 60 years is, is the 1960s. Um, it's, it's within uh, living memory of many of us, uh, not all of us, um, but uh, to have lived through the 60s and remember it and to write about something that is within living memory. It's not two generations ago. It's, it's, it's really within the memory of those of us who are alive. So there are in Scott's audience, people who remember the events that he's talking about. There are veterans of the events, uh, the wars, who, uh, the, the invasion of 1745. And Scott would have known and would have been able to speak directly himself to people who lived through that experience. So 60 years is, is an interesting um, segment of time. It's a, it's a distance, it's something that implies a distance, but also a proximity. And it connects the past to the present. So in the Gothic novels of Anne Radcliffe, for example, who's one of the novelist that he dismisses in that introductory chapter. Um, we don't know exactly the date of the events of the mysteries of Udolpho. And in a way, it doesn't matter. It just happened so long ago that we don't need to know the precise date of it. But with Waverly, we need to know the precise date in order to understand it, because we can't understand the present Scott is arguing, unless we understand the relationship between the present and the past. And history is important because history is what shapes the present. That's, that's one of the new things that Scott is, is introducing. So 60 years since seems to me a really crucial part of uh, you know, Scott's way of positioning, of locating his novel for us. So anybody have any other thoughts, questions about introduction as a? Tiger? Oh, um, yeah, when I see a paragraph go on for several pages, I go, yikes. Um, so reading that introduction was, was real work. Um, but when I got, it was, it was uh, actually in the dark, some of the darker days of the uh, pandemic, early days when um, so many question marks and such fear. So I was, uh, got to the dinner party, the drunken dinner party, and I heard myself laughing. And I thought, this is a good book. I can do that. <laughs> Yeah, so it turns out I like I like I like it after that. Okay. I, I think the experience of finding Scott a slow read is 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 quite general. I mean, particularly for modern readers who are used to having a sort of bang up introduction to hook the reader. And Scott's um, manner of of telling stories is slow. He gets a slow start. It's a slow wind-up. And I think the novel gets faster and faster and faster the further you get into it. And in a way, I think the slowness of the beginning is deliberate. It's, it, he wants to start slow so that you'll notice how the novel picks up speed as it develops. Um, but any other comments? Deborah? <laughs> yeah, sorry, I keep forgetting how to unmute my, my thing. Um, yeah, I was thinking um, 
as you said, that 60 years ago would have been the 1960s. And I was thinking at that time we had a war going on. We had the Vietnam War going on. And this is, exactly. and it's very interesting to think back sort of maybe where the Vietnam fits in our cultural imagination today and to try to like project onto what it would have been like to think about a, a war that took place 60 years before the writing of this novel. And um, I was thinking that I think the 60 years is so deliberately chosen because it's like a generational thing. Um, I am just barely old enough to say I was born in the 60s, um, but of course I don't remember it, but I have the generation before me, my parents and my aunts and uncles were profoundly affected by it. And I think there's something um, that 60 years is chosen deliberately so that he has, when he has a young male protagonist, when he's speaking to if you're speaking to 20 year olds or 30 year olds or you know young people you know teens of of the early 1800s they can project you know to them this seems like so long ago this seems so almost as if it has nothing to do with their lives the war wars of 1745 or the wars of the 1960s and wars have such long shadows i have a, a bizarre piece of trivia i just love bizarre pieces of trivia but the last person to receive government benefits from the Civil War, from the U.S. Civil War, just died last week. And that just tells you something about like how we think of wars and, and also we think of them as so generational, or the greatest generation. And I think that that 60 years is, so, is chosen for a reason because it's the lifespan of a person more, you know, more or less or of that time perhaps. Um, and it's enough to distance the generations. Yeah. No, very, very good observations and I think apt. And uh, as speaking as someone who, who grew up in the American South where the Civil War was still very much alive in the memory and consciousness of my parents and my grandparents, um, I, I, I think evoking the the memory and the way in which memory is handed down from generation to generation is uh, is quite relevant. Um, I'm keeping an eye on time and I want to try and get a little further into into the novel and the next section so I'm going to um, ask David to to go ahead and and help us with the next section which uh, and, and I'll, I'll introduce it by saying um, something about the structure of the novel. Scott is sometimes described as uh, not paying very careful attention to the form of the novel. He's sort of a careless writer and um, it's, it's slow. And, but if you stop and think about the organization of volume one, uh, after the introduction, it's divided into four sections. And each section has a location. Each location has a house or a dwelling place. In each location, there's a principal male figure who is um, many of whom are father figures for uh, Edward Waverley, who is someone whose own father's birth father is strikingly absent from much of, of the novel. So he's one of those sort of orphan or pseudo orphan figures that we find so many of in Dickens and other 19th century novels. So each location has a house, each location or dwelling place has a male figure, each uh, location has a girl in it uh, who, uh, for one reason or another, seems to surge into prominence. And each location has a language that's associated with it. So as you move from the introduction, which is written completely in English, you had, you know, you may not have enjoyed it, but you had no difficulty understanding it. But when you get to uh, Waverly Honor, uh, you encounter uh, Sir Everard, and Sir Everard's language is, is different. Um, he's in the north of England. And then when you get to the lowlands, you get, a, you get Scots. And Scots is a dialect of English, but it has a lot of words, a vocabulary that's different. And then when you get to Donald Bain Lane's cave and certainly into the highlands, you're in a completely 
other language, which is Gaelic. And so one of the things that is happening in this novel is that you're moving from place to place to place, but there are parallels in structure between each, each of these places. And the second place that we are introduced to is Sir Everard and, and Waverly Honor. And um, I'd like to get David involved and have David tell us um, more about the historical background to this novel. That's another thing that some people uh, find a little challenging about this novel is telling about a history that is not as familiar to contemporary readers as certainly it would have been to, uh, uh, I mean, by which I mean modern readers, as it would have been to readers uh, in 1814. So um, David, could you help us to understand this pertinent historical background to, uh, uh, to Waverly? I think we may have lost David. We may have lost David. David. Well, I was going to I was going to ask uh, David to talk about the the if you will the backstory. The novel is set in. It, tell me, Courtney, if David comes back. He may have had some problems with his technology. I I see his name in in a square, so maybe he's he's rejoining us. Um, but the, the historical background, I mean, uh, the novel is, are you there, David? I'm here. Okay, I was, I was inviting you to tell us more about the historical background to, uh, to Waverly, particularly as it connects with, yes. with, uh, yeah. with Waverly's family, because in, in the second section, the, uh, when he goes to stay with Sir Everard, uh, we learn about his, his own family history. Okay. Original uh, read. have to answer the question. What was this 1745 rebellion? Who were these people? And what were they upset about? History never begins nothing, and it often doesn't end either. And I think to explain the Jacobites, I really have to go back to 1603. <laughs> That's not the beginning. The Stuart dynasty had reigned in Scotland since 1371. I don't need that for 1603, Queen and was seated by King James of Scotland, who became King James the first of England. James was her first cousin twice removed. He was the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, and uh, he was removed from having anything to do with her before he was one. Uh, he really had no sentimental connection. Point the James that we're probably going to have to execute his mother. And James indicated back that he would endeavor to bear this as long as he remained the lovely Queen Elizabeth. I can't tell what I mean. So are we, are you hearing me? I can see John, it, can you wave hearing me? David, we're, we're having some trouble hearing you, at least I am, you're, you're breaking up as, as you speak. So. I'm not sure if that's because you have a bad internet connection or not, but it, it was hard to again. 
Let's see if that's okay. And I think we lost him again. We, we lost him again. Um, well, I, I, was, I was counting on David to give us some historical background, but um, yes, Glenna. Glenna is waving. I, um, I could give a little historical background. Um, so the Stuarts were driven out by the Glorious Revolution in the late 1600s and uh, replaced by William and Mary and then uh, who were uh, who had Stuart blood but who were much more Protestant much uh, the Stuarts uh, James II in, to a certain extent Charles II and James II were leaning more Catholic and more high church and uh, they were that dynasty was driven out when uh, William and Mary took over, it was a, a, a what shall I say, a reinvigoration of the Protestant moment in England. And then uh, Mary, who was the one who actually, William was, the, was from the Netherlands. Mary was the one uh, who had the Stuart blood. Her sister Anne, Queen Anne, uh, inherited. Queen Anne had 16 hydrocephalic children none of whom lived to take over. So the throne went to a collateral branch of the family, the Hanoverians, Germans, and uh, that was George I. And uh, that was, I think, 1715, which is when there's the first Stuart uprising, the 15, as it was called. But uh, it's, it's um, Scottish, um, Patriotism, it's uh, religious differences with uh, what's going on in, in England. It's all these things that are feeding first the 15 and the 45. And I also wanted to mention that some great writers uh, were fascinated. I'm thinking of uh, Boswell and Johnson because uh, when uh, Boswell, James Boswell, Johnson's biographer, when um, he, he came from Scotland and when Johnson, when they had their encounter, uh, Johnson was very interested to hear more about what had happened with the uh, 15 and 45 as they're called. And the two men uh, made a trip together to the Hebrides and both of them wrote about it. So this tells you that in England as well as in Scotland, there was considerable fascination with uh, this whole episode or series of episodes. And that yes. I think, was the background for why Scott became so, you know, why lots of people and not just Scots wanted to read. And um, just to, I'll add a couple of things. It's important to locate Waverly, our, the hero, uh, the protagonist of, of this novel, in relation to the various historical strands and conflicts that you have just mentioned, because uh, his family is, is English, but they are aristocrats. They are from the upper class, which is sympathetic to the Stuart um, uh, dynasty, many of whom are sympathetic to the Stuart dynasty. And Sir Everard is someone who is both a high Tory uh, and therefore um, by virtue of his social class and also his religious inclinations, uh, sympathetic toward uh, the uh, Stuart dynasty. But Waverly's father, who is a second son and therefore does not stand to inherit the estate, is sympathetic to the Whigs, to the Hanoverians in London. And he is what Scott at one point calls a place man. A place man is someone who, because he doesn't stand to inherit, uh, has to make his own way in the world. And one way to make your way in the world is to join the winning political side. So he's represented 
as someone who is a Whig. And there's a, there's a kind of cordial um, dislike or enmity between the two brothers, between Sir Richard and between Richard Waverley, who is uh, Edward's father, and Sir Everard, his, his uncle. Um, and within Sir Everard's family, within the, the Waverley family, there's another link to an even further, uh, more remote past, which is the English Civil War. Because um, uh, in Sir Everard's family, there was a schism and one part of the family supported Oliver Cromwell and the, uh, uh, the roundheads who rebelled against the Stuarts and established the, the Commonwealth in the middle of the 17th century. So that, that civil war is in the background of the current civil war, that is the 1745, uh, uh, the 45 as it's known, and the 15, which were attempts to restore the Stuart dynasty and which also involve the religious conflicts um, that date back to the Civil War. So there's uh, high, ch high Church, Church of England, which is sympathetic to the Roman Catholic uh, faith, and the Highlanders are predominantly Catholic. Remember, you'll, when we when we meet Fergus and his sister, one of the things that we learn is that they were educated in France, and that she was educated in a convent. Um, that Flora was so. There's religious conflict. There's uh, different dynasties. Um, at one point in the the um, the the dinner party, the comic dinner party in the in in the at Waverly Honor that leads to the duel. Um, uh, Balmawapel, uh, the, <laughs> the, the comic character uh, who gets into an argument with, with Waverly, uh, proposes a toast to the little gentleman in black who caused uh, the William to stumble. And this goes back to an apocryphal story that there was a little mole that made King William's horse stumble and then brought about his, his death. So this toast to the gentleman in black is in fact an anti-Hanoverian uh, um, toast. And Edward as a loyal uh, English subject and someone who's soon going to join the, uh, the army, um, or, or at this point, I guess he has he has joined the army. Uh, feels that he should challenge Balmawapel to a duel, but of course he doesn't get there in time. Um, so, anyway, the 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 backstory, the history goes back for over a century prior to uh, the events that are the contemporary events in the historical narrative. And those enmities, those rivalries that have to do with who will inherit the estate and that are uh, being played out at the level of economics and politics, as well as religion, are an important part of the, the history of, of this novel. And those are things that would have been um, uh, just familiar to all the contemporary readers of Waverly, uh, at, certainly as as much as uh, you know the, the Vietnam War uh, for us sixty years ago is still part of our present consciousness. Does anyone want to add to or ask questions about? Uh, so Courtney, help us. Irene. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, I'll start by saying that I, I expected to love this novel, which I hadn't read before and didn't. So I really had trouble getting into it. I've read several Scott novels and loved them all, uh, but this one was different. And I'm, the more I'm hearing just now, the more I'm realizing it's probably because 
Scott at this point was writing from an English perspective. And I think his later novels, he got more involved with Scotland and his perspective changed. Maybe that's a personal impression. But I found Waverley himself an unattractive character at the beginning. I'm not sure if that will change. I'm beginning to get into the novel now I've got as far as chapter 23. And I, I stopped there just to, to read other things. I'll come back to it. But I was beginning to get into it. But I just to say that one or two things about what was being said about the history were, were striking me. Uh, you know, for example, suggesting that it was Highland versus Lowland. It wasn't quite as clear cut as that in 45. Uh, from what I can see and hear from the Scottish history, it was only parts of the West, Northwest, that had kept the Catholic tradition. Most of the other lords in Scotland, both north in the South and in the North and East, had gone over to the Presbyterianism in the time of 1603, James I. So they had a long tradition of Presbyterianism. Uh, so, uh, and I'm particularly interested in this, and I'll just may say as a personal thing, because my family name of my, on my mother's side is Cameron, and our family tradition is that our ancestor was coachman to Cameron of Lothiel, who raised the standard for Bonnie Prince Charlie at Glenfinnan. So I have a personal sort of interest all my life in this story and coming to it, I just was disappointed because it was just as if this whole Jacobite tradition was being treated in a, an unfavorable way uh, in this novel in a way that's not common in literature. That's all I want to say. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it, it is the case that uh, Scott's view of these historical backgrounds differs somewhat in, in other novels that are historical novels, the, the, uh, particularly the Scottish novels. He writes, obviously, Ivanhoe and, and others that are set in different historical periods. But uh, uh, I think we need to, to wait, perhaps, until the end of the novel before we decide whether it's written from an English perspective or uh, from a Scottish perspective or how those conflicting perspectives are negotiated, particularly by the narrator, because it's the, it's the narrator more than the hero, um, the protagonist, Edward. And the, the question of whether we, how much we like Edward is, is one I'd like to also to, to keep in mind. What kind of protagonist is uh, Edward? Uh, the narrator frequently calls him our hero, um, but uh, what kind of hero is Edward Waverley? And his, his name is, is certainly a clue in that direction. I mean, the, the name Waverley, we talked about, or I mentioned the, the, uh, the type names, that names are always significant in, uh, in Scott. And uh, uh, Waverley is a, someone who wavers. Um, and his perspective is an inconsistent one, uh, so we, we can we can talk further about that. But other other comments about uh, um, the historical background, Courtney, help us. Um, no one has raised their hand. We have people who are waving oh. their hands. Okay. Uh, how about Murray? We're not hearing Murray. You think you need to unmute. Murray needs to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Scott is writing at a moment of great change. And he institutes not just historical background, as you called it, John, but your earlier comment about the Civil War is much more in America is quite relevant because what he's doing is creating a situation where history has become mythological, if you will, uh, and deep in religious values and uh, religious conflicts. Um, and these are not just data or facts of change, but these are ongoing 
uh, situations. And he's talking about great changes that happened to England and Scotland together. And he's uh, beginning modern uh, culture, if you will, where history is crucial as change and development, if you will, and transformation and reconciliation of warring factions. We have, after all, the French Revolution also in the background that transformed in France, but also produced ongoing rifts in what it was to be French. So this is history as memorialization, if you will, as mythologization. And the beginning is all about taking history and making it more than facts, but about the very nature of personal identity. It resides in Waverly. One, um, yes, and that that dynamic and between history as myth and history as uh, a, a, as living process is, I think, one of the important dynamics in in the novel. Um, history is is not just something that is dead in this novel. History is something that is happening now. And I think that's that's an important contribution to uh, to literature in uh, on the part of on the part of Scott. And um, there's there's a moment at uh, Waverly Honor where uh, Aunt Rachel, you remember who Aunt Rachel is, the um, uh, the unmarried sister uh, who lives with uh, in Sir Everard's house. She, traces tells the story about a Waverly ancestor who um, uh, who defended Charles the first and enabled Charles the first to escape when the um, uh, the forces of Cromwell were uh, on soon to uh, on on his heels and about to overtake him and there are drops of blood on the floor of Waverly Honor, where a wound was given. And Waverly is asked to trace those drops of blood. And every Waverly uh, encounters those drops of blood. So that, that's part of family history. It's part of family legend. And it's also closely intertwined with the, uh, the forces of history that are working themselves out uh, in, in the novel. So history is is very much alive. I guess that's the point I'm trying I'm trying to make. That history is is lived not as something that's dead in the past, as in the novels of Anne Radcliffe, but something that is current and present in the minds and hearts and and blood of the people in in this novel. Um, but there there was another comment and question. I saw a hand being waved. Uh, so, uh, William and Vicky, William, do you still have something that you'd like to say? Sort of, I have a question. Um, it's something you raised, John, when you were talking about how um, the issues of the historical period have some re resonance in the contemporary period of the time of the writing of the novel. So, it seems as though Scott is presenting the Jacobites and the non-jurors of 1745 as rather quixotic characters who are still fighting a battle from 1688. And that matter was actually sort of already settled. Is, was that a problem? And they're questioning the legitimacy of the Hanoverian dynasty. Was there a similar problem in Scott's period of people questioning the legitimacy of the present order that was settled in 1814? Um, it, was, it was not as, as um, pressing an issue, shall we say, in 1814 as it was in 1745. But there were still uh, sympathies and, and memories that were very strong. Uh, um, the, the issues, there, there were religious issues that were still to some extent alive. 
But the contemporary issues that, that lie more in the background have to do with the French Revolution and with Napoleon. I mean, you know, the, the Napoleonic Wars are taking place simultaneously. At the moment, we're, we're, you know, a year away from Waterloo. Um, so uh, England and France are rival uh, dynasties at, at this moment. So, so the, the force of, of history in the present moment on Scott. Scott is, Scott, as David mentioned, uh, mustered a, a, a small troop of, uh, of soldiers to defend against a French invasion that was, um, so those are the contemporary issues that have to do with historical change, whether historical change should take place through violence or whether it should take place through compromise. The other date that needs to be mentioned is the Act of Union in 1707, which is when uh, England and Scotland officially became one country. And that country's name is Britain. And one thing that's interesting to track in, uh, in reading the novel is uh, uh, whether the word Britain is ever used, uh, because Britain implies a unified nation. And um, there certainly are Scottish nationalist feelings that are uh, uh, dormant at this point. Scotland has a different uh, legal system. Uh, Scotland has a different educational system from, from England. So the tensions between England and Scotland are by no means settled at this point. Although officially there is one country whose name is, is Britain. Yes, I see a hand and I, I, can't, I can't recognize. <laughs> There's a hand raised and I, and I... Yes, Vicky. Hello. Um, I'm English and uh, there is a great need to understand that once the Tudors came to power, there was the concern about having a, a boy child to be king. Yes. although we had had a queen way in our history before and certainly the british had done some terrible things to the scots which had certainly not enamored them well i'm sorry if i use british i mean english i'm <laughs> pardon i'm sorry it's not not meant to incriminate anybody and there was a, a deep feeling at that time and of course the english had had to change religion according to who the king was and all the other stuff that went with it. And so they knew very well they'd better hop on their toes oh, because God, otherwise, sorry, I beg your pardon. Um, and the history was very important to both the Scottish and the English people because it kept them as united or within their own groups and rightly so, for the Scots had a lot to complain about, um, the crofting and so on. And so it was very important that the English side knew and the Scottish side knew what was going on was important to them. And I have to say that Ivanhoe is a very English book, which the English grab in regard to, you know, seeing the other side of things. Yes. Uh, um, you know, just as a passing comment. So history was very important then and it kept the sores of, and pain of, of the differences going between the countries, of course, which I don't approve of, because um, we are united now, you know, all of <laughs> Who knows? Although Scottish independence is still very much alive in the present moment. Uh, oh, it, yeah, it is. <laughs> but, but we've, you know, we've sort of integrated and we've perhaps not integrated and yes, yes. it all it all gets very old and and needs to be a united in in my art of some sort we need some union or not <laughs> okay i'm i'm uh still getting used to to handling as many people in this conversation as uh as we have and i i want to jump ahead a little bit, uh, perhaps not following my plan as closely as I had originally intended, to ask what people think about our hero, ab about Edward as uh, protagonist of this novel. And 
Um, one of the things that uh, is often claimed about Scott as, uh, as an important historical novelist is that he came up with the idea for a certain kind of hero that would be the prototype for subsequent heroes in historical novels. And uh, that hero is uh, someone who is perhaps not as heroic as the title or as the term hero uh, would, would initially seem to indicate. And I, I, I would submit that every time that the narrator uses the term our hero, that he does so with a certain amount of irony. So uh, where, do, where do you place Edward Waverley, our hero, uh, in the course of events in, in, this, in this novel? Right. Oh, hi, yes. Um, I actually had a comment about the previous thing, so maybe I should just sure. wait until you Do go both. forward. Um, I, I was going to ask just, just quickly, briefly, about the, the comment you made about should social change take place through violence or political exchange, if that was the underlying theme or question of the material. And I, I, I just can't help but thinking about this material and all of us here and wondering if, if as we discuss this, wondering if we can't bring that question into the present day and, and see if there are any, any similarities to, to thematic questions and thematic times and how we, we struggle to, as you talked about the place man, wondered how we had to, to struggle hard to inherit the society that's come before us? Is it given to us or do we have to find another way to take our place in it? And I don't need to, you don't need to respond to that directly. I just wondered if that was a theme we might think about or talk about as we go forward as well. Um, a very apt comment and I think a question that's very much alive today in 2020 in the country where we live and in others, but at our particular historical moment. Anne? Well, in a way, that's a bit of a segue to the question you're asking, John, about Waverly as a protagonist and um, how, how readers take him. And I'll just have to admit, I've taught this novel several times in my 19th century literature and culture of Scotland. Um, and I've asked students often, well, what do you think about Waverly? And I don't want to give away parts of the novel we haven't you know, to which we haven't arrived yet. Right. Thank, thank, thank you think, for not, not giving spoilers, but yes. But one of the things that um, they find is that he's a wonderful protagonist by the end of the novel because of his openness at a young age, their similar age, to the various places he goes. Sort of, he has this, as you talked about, a very complex background in a way, family members on um, different political sides. He's learned the family history. Yet as a young man, he's very open to the experiences that unfold in a very dramatic fashion as he moves from one region to another, from one country to another country, and then various areas in that. And so in a way, he becomes a very attractive protagonist in that sense. As you point out, he's not particularly heroic at times in the ways one might think of that, but he does have an attraction to students even in his foibles, um, and when he shows faults at times, that, that makes him more believable in many ways to young readers, for instance, than another one would, who has very strong opinionated uh, stances on the variety of issues he experiences along the way. So. Yes, I, I, think, I think to call him attractive is a very good word to, to use. Attractive in the sense that, um, young readers, but I, I think many readers are drawn to him. Certainly many people inside the novel are, are drawn to him. Um, uh, he, he passes through the world and he, he, he makes a lot of friends or people who are kind to him, uh, 
drawn to him. And he is, um, a, again, referencing back to the introduction, he's, he's, uh, his, his shield is blank, his shield is, is white. It hasn't yet formed the heraldic allegiances that would define him in a particular ideological or religious or political uh, uh, way. And that openness to experience and that curiosity that, um, you know, he's, he, he gets an invitation to spend time, you know, take a trip into the highlands. Oh, sure, I'll go, uh, you know. Um, it's, it's a very youthful response and I think engaging, attractive in that sense. Uh, do people have other comments ab about Edward as um, as protagonist? Uh, Deborah. Um, yeah, I was thinking sort of a, a word that <clears throat> keeps coming up in my mind that I think we're kind of scooting around is nostalgia. And this is there's something I again I have not made it to the end of the book. And thank you, by the way, to to our English and Scottish participants. That's a really great perspective. Um, but the extent to which this is nostalgic about the uh, the 45 and about the possibility that it could have gone the other way. And I think whenever you write about a war from the perspective of the side that lost, that question is always sort of at the back of the, the reader's mind that this is, are they trying, is the, the narrator trying to say it would have been better if they had won or what if they had won or is there something romantic or heroic about the fact that they fought this lost cause or you know and i sort of feel like that's kind of floating around the background and i don't know and this is i think what draws edward to their cause he's he is a kind of romantic big r you know he is he he's very open to experience. He has an open curiosity and an open heart. He's like a big puppy dog kind of to me. It seems like people kind of just like him, and because he's interested in them, being a part. And I was really intrigued by. I don't entirely know if I understood Irene's point from earlier, um, but in my mind, I'm not a Scott expert. I think of him as kind of entwined in the kind of nostalgia about Scotland and the sort of romanticization of Scotland, just him being part of, you know, plaid and out the outlander effect and you know, <laughs> just the, the sort of, you know, part of uh, whiskey and, and, and the romanticization, Burns Nights. And I think of him just as all of a piece of that. And I was wondering, um, you know, sort of, she seemed to think that he was criticizing the Jacobites or taking the side of the English against the Jacobites. And I just, that's not how I read it, I guess. I just said it. Um, so the question about how does this relate to what's going on now? Um, to me, when I read the whole drunken person gets offended and pulls out a sword and all that, I'm thinking, you know, this is ridiculous. We don't fight duels all over this anymore. <laughs> and they, um, you know, somebody intervened. But we are now fighting duels over face masks. Exactly. People are getting shot. You have to be very careful not to say something to somebody who's not wearing a face mask because they are going to be very mad at you. And... <laughs> You know, what's the difference? Thank you for that comment. I, I, I think um, it, it's, it's very apt uh, to, to think about our moment in terms of the ideological conflicts that we are experiencing on a daily basis over uh, something as simple as, as wearing masks. Um, um, I'll, we have about 10 minutes left and we haven't gotten um, all that far in terms of the, the story. I, w I wanted to ask about um, milk cows. What do you see as the importance of the, um, the milk cow incident, which is really what prompts one of the major transitions in the novel? 
it's it's what results in the invitation to take a tour in the highlands so what do people have any thoughts about the milk cows irene yeah. irene uh yes uh I'm particularly, I was particularly interested in that interest, in that incident because I lived for 18 years before I came here in Dumfries in the borderlands. And that is a live tradition, if you like, there. There is a place near Dumfries known as the Devil's Beef Tub, which was where the reavers, as they were called, brought the cattle that they stole from the north of England. And this happened for several hundred years that, uh, uh, people in the south of Scotland, the Scotsmen in this, living in the south, would cross the border and, and steal cattle from uh, various lords and other estates around the north of England and drive them over the border and hide them in places like the, the Devil's Beef Tub near Dumfries. Mm -hmm. So I, I was very interested in that aspect of it because it's something I could identify with. I think it was simply used in the novel as a way to get us across the border because the cattle were stolen, uh, what was going to happen? You couldn't ignore this. They, all their cattle were gone. He could, the Lord couldn't afford to do without them. Uh, so they, they had to do something, but they had a problem because they hadn't been paying their taxes to the guy who could have stopped it. Uh, uh, and the, the, you know, sort of, so it was, but it was simply a device to get Waverley over the border, to get him meeting up with the uh, first of all, in the cave with the ones who'd stolen it, then with the, with Fergus and his sister, uh, and through them to get involved in the whole war situation, which otherwise we might not have happened. It certainly is a device that is that performs that function. But I I I asked the question not, and and you're correct to say that there's a long historical tradition of reavers and cattle stealing and. Um, one of the tensions between Highland and Lowland uh, in, involves the theft of cattle. And so there's a historical basis for this that, that Scott would have known. But who steals the cattle and why? David? Well, in this case, you, know, no, you go ahead, someone else go ahead. Is that... Who steals the cattle and why? Well, I mean, I would have said that it was stolen simply because they, the, the, uh, this was a thief <laughs> who was involved. We're told that he is, they're in two minds about whether to protect him or not because he is a thief. Uh, but uh, in this, uh, you know, sort of normally he is given a bit of cover because he does help Fergus with some of his uh, other things that he's doing. He gives him some cover, he lets him, you know, sort of be at, unassailed within his lands. But I don't think is there anything more to it than that? I think there's a lot more to it. Excuse me for <laughs> interposing. Um, I think Fergus told Donald to steal the cows. Um, and uh, one of the things that is very clever, I think, about the way that Scott has constructed this story is that Edward is, is he doesn't realize that he's living in history. Um, he's, he's, if you will, asleep. And, and Edward, remember, Edward sleeps through the duel. Uh, he intends to fight the duel, but he, he, he never gets there in time, and the Baron fights it for him. My dog has just come into the room. Um, the whole thing is a setup, because Edward is a pawn in the larger political struggle that is going on. So Fergus knows all about Edward's arrival with the Baron. And he sees Edward as a valuable asset because he believes that if Edward joins the rebellion, then other English families who are sympathetic will also join the rebellion. And so, uh, he tells Donald to steal the cows and then to be ready to give them back um, because what he wants to do is to seduce Edward into coming into the Highlands because he knows that Edward is impressionable and that if he puts on a good enough show that he will win Edward over to the cause. 
So what's the next step in what I have called the seduction? It's the appearance of Evan Du. Evan Du is the Highlander who comes in full Highland costume to the, um, the Baron's house and shows up and uh, says, wouldn't you like to take a journey into the Highlands? And Edward is so impressed by this Highlander in full dress costume that of course he says yes. Again, the plot continues. Um, what else is there that is a setup in this? Uh, Fergus, Fergus, when Fergus greets Waverley on his first arrival in the Highlands, he says, um, oh, I just happen to have a hundred of my men here. Would you like to see a military display? Um, uh, he knows that Edward is coming. He sent Donald to pick him up and to bring him back. Uh, Ed, Edward is a, a neophyte in the Highlands. He, he, he gets fatigued by walking through the mountains. Um, at one point, he has to be carried in a boat. Uh, he's, 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 a, he's a kind of passive hero. His passivity is one of the striking features about him. And he doesn't know that these historical forces are being acted out through his body, through his person, in the name of a larger political plot to which he is completely ignorant. So the milk cows is the first incident in this, what I'm calling seduction of, of Edward into the, the political cause. Can you think of others? David and then Carl. Okay. Uh, I think the milk cows also are, showing Edward that he's in a different culture. He's in a culture where you have to expect somebody may come and steal your cattle if you don't pay the blackmail. Edward is getting, is moving progressively into strange country. It's strange to him and probably strange to a lot of the readers. The other thing I want to say is that one of the points that Scott makes in introducing Edward that is really important is that his education was unsystematic. He doesn't know how to work at something. He hasn't any particular discipline. When he goes into the army and becomes a captain, which is a rank of some importance, he doesn't really bother to learn what he's supposed to be doing. So he's, in a lot of ways, uh, raw. He's had very little social exposure. He's not, he hasn't much standard of judgment. Stop there. Yeah, I guess I would argue though that Scott is redefining for us the moral code of Scotland by remarking that he who steals a cow from a poor widow is a thief. He that lifts a drove from a Sassanac lair is a gentleman drover. Yes. So Scott really is romanticizing MacIver and the Highlanders in much the same way that Milton did for Satan. And I think we have to be very careful that our emotions and our values are being manipulated by this fictional technique. And the cattle incident is certainly one of those moments where the clever reader needs to realize you are having your definitions changed in front of your very eyes. Yes, yes, very, very good, very good. Um, and uh, sometimes the, the narrator tells us things and we may think this is the narrator speaking the narrator's opinions, but the narrator is also presenting things through the perspective of different characters. And that technique, which is the, we would call focalization, means that uh, you have to be a, an astute reader of the narrator to be able to distinguish what are the genuine opinions of the narrator. And the narrator certainly does have opinions, 
um, and the opinions of the characters as presented through the voice uh, of the narrator. And then, and the narrator is um, sometimes on both sides of some of those questions. Uh, so uh, it's one of the things I think that that makes this novel more complicated than it than it first appears to to be. But uh, your points are very well taken. I mean, uh, and there is a kind of um, satanic dimension to Fergus MacIver uh, as well, and a um, uh, who is an astute politician and not just a simple Highland lord. Uh, so his French background is, is an important aspect of his particular history as well. And his ambition, which is uh, Luciferian uh, as well, um, is, is something we should not overlook. But I'll just mention one other, it's four o'clock and it's time to, to end. Uh, I'll mention one other part of the seduction, if you will, of, um, of Edward. And it's the, the famous scene, famous because it's one of the most romantic in the, in the novel, where Flora uh, sings her song, her translation of the bard's uh, um, uh, poem, uh, which in the, the poem, it turns out, is a call to arms. But when Flora performs that, she sets a stage which is very theatrical. She doesn't just say, oh, here's a translation of the poem. She says, just a second, I'll, I'll, I'll go and I'll invite you to come and I'm gonna go down by the waterfall and she appears and uh, it's, it's a very rehearsed and theatrical moment. And I think Flora is part of the seduction of, of Waverly. We'll have to decide about whether we think she's um, part of the conspiracy or, or not. But she wants even more than Fergus, or for, for purer reasons, I think, than Fergus, for Waverly to join the rebellion. Um, because she is a true fanatic, a true believer. And Fergus, uh, Fergus has, has mixed motives. Um, but anyway, when, when we see that, when we read the scene about Flora's performance of the of the heroic poem by the waterfall i think we need to read it as part of the nostalgia the creation of romantic scotland um, which certainly scott is engaged in to some extent but also as a theatrical performance that's being presented to us as a calculated strategy on the part of people who have designs on Waverly's presence and his body. And so uh, he's a pawn in this much larger game that he remains unaware of. And that contributes to much of the comedy of, of the novel, that Waverly doesn't understand that he's living in history, that he's living in historical time. He thinks he's a tourist. He thinks he's on vacation, <laughs> uh, you know, and, um, you know, that's, Part of the attraction, I think, to some younger students uh, who, who who read this novel is that they um, they don't see and don't understand, and that's that's perhaps a point on which to end. But I think you know people have made several comments about the relevance of the uh, of this novel to the historical moment in which we are living. I think it's it's often difficult for people. For me, I'll, I'll speak personally, to realize that I am living in history, that, that this particular moment is not just my daily life. It's not just what I read in the headlines. It is part of a larger historical movement that I may not fully understand, whose roots lie in the past, and we need to look back to our own past in order to understand where we are now, and we can only speculate about where this present moment in history is going to lead us. Um, so I'll end there. Uh, thank you so much. Those of you who have, have uh, read through chapter 23, uh, 
read I'll see you in a month and David and I will resume um, and uh, I look forward to seeing you then so thank you once again thank you thank Bye -bye. you thank you everybody thank Bye. you John thank you David Bye. and thank you all you wonderful historians who with your input it was great great thank great you. stuff thank you thank you yes, yeah. thanks a lot